You are now tuned in to the Property Management Show with your host, Alex Osanenko. We bring in the experts of today so you can be the master of tomorrow in all things property management. Whether it's getting more doors, running a profitable fee-based business, or by simply being the best property manager. So, grab a pen and paper because this episode is sure to be a good one. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hey guys, um, welcome to another episode of the Property Management Show. It's great to be back with you. I have uh, a very, well, not controversial, but popular topic. And I have a guest who can help me think through this topic, talk through this topic, and hopefully mutually we'll come up with some answers and interesting discoveries that you, our dear audience, can make use of in your own businesses. My guest today is Mike Callis. He is the CEO and president of Marketplace Homes. Mike, how are you today? I'm doing awesome, Alex. Thanks thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it, man. Love your energy. Love your energy. I already feel it's going to be a good one. So (laughs) tell us, like Marketplace Homes, not everybody know who you are and kind of where you at. Do you mind sharing a little bit of your kind of a growth story and just set us up? Yeah. Uh, So 11 years ago, uh, I was 26 years old, and we were here in beautiful metro Detroit, sunshiny area that it is. And uh, the market uh, pretty much collapsed, and uh, I was working for a large national builder at the time, and and we kind of had to branch off. So uh, we we started at that point um, pretty much in my basement, you know, trying to help people get out of their existing home and into a new one. And you know, at that time, pretty much the only way to do that was to rent out your home. Uh, so we ran some programs on that, and um, we we grew really fast. I mean, um, we started to kind of take off and get some traction during that period of time. We were on the Inc. 500 list uh, four years in a row as one of the fastest growing companies in the United States. Uh, we grew into 19 markets and uh, currently manage about 3,100 doors. Wow. And it's growing really fast. I mean, we're adding probably right now 150 to 200 doors a month. And what is your end game here? I mean, where are you going? Where, where is your vision next four or five years? What are you doing with this thing? Uh, complete utter exhaustion until death, Alex. Is, uh, what I'm <laughs> well, that's every entrepreneur. But besides that, oh, 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 well, are there like reasons you're doing this? Um, well, well, we we have a, a, a little bit of a different feeling. We, we think of this is a, a great industry that can um, actually um, – it's recurring revenue and at scale could go public and actually get the multiples that it deserves. And so that that really is our our end game and what we're shooting for is to get about thirty thousand homes under management oh, wow. and um, be the first public property manager, I think on earth. I'm not really sure. So yeah, that, no, that's awesome. What you're gonna do is you, so you're not looking, or maybe you will roll it up and sell it as an asset because that's some of the larger players. That's sort of the end goal for for a lot of them. And you know that, that's great because it's as you say, recurring revenue. There's a lot of consistency and evaluations right now a pretty low for buying the portfolios off some smaller firms. By the way, that's our topic today, acquisitions, because guess what? Marketplace Homes has done a number of acquisitions, and and you guys are looking for more, right? Yeah. So, I mean, um, that's something that, you know, we found there's a lot of people that are kind of that accidental property manager, just like there's a lot of accidental landlords out there. And, you know, now the market's just red hot, man. I mean, the you know, sales are popping. And so there's a lot of those brokers that were making money selling homes and, you know, maybe they have small portfolios and they haven't really reached the scale. And so they're so in the business that it's burning them out a little bit. Um, so, you know, if somebody was at that point or ready to retire, um, we, we are actively pursuing those portfolios and, um, you know, helping people out so that they can go hang out on an Island if they're at that, that point. Um, and you know, if we can add some extra doors to our company, we're, we're really excited to do that. Awesome. So 3,100 going to 30,000. How long do you give yourself? About two weeks. Um, so I'm really hoping this podcast uh-huh. blows up, man. I mean, like, you know, I, <laughs> no, we, we're, uh, we got a five year, year plan to get there. Um, and we've kind of invested in a lot of the people and processes and stuff up front. So, I mean, we have a team of about 85 people right now. Um, and so we're, we're pretty ready and staffed up to be able to handle a lot of growth. So speaking of growth, uh, actually now the, the reverse of growth, uh, uh, dying, closing doors. Um, you familiar with Castle, your fellow Detroiter? Um, yeah, talked to him today. Um, Max? 
Yeah. Yeah. I just had a conversation, recorded another podcast with uh, Brett Larson. We talked about the situation with Castle, the fact that they closed the doors and stuff like that. Um, that is pretty... That is, that's pretty bad news all around, but I think we will learn a lot of things. Do you have any insight that, about you know, what went wrong with that? Man, so um, it's weird, right? Because um, on one hand, that's a competitor. So when we're all in a competitive landscape, you sort of are supposed to wish death on all of your competitors. And, right. and um, right. it doesn't feel that way in that case. Like I, I think that those that was a group of good people um, that um, – are kind of inspiring people actually. I mean, they, they moved from California, came out here to Detroit, um, started a company. Uh, we're doing some good stuff. And I, I really think that the things they did were good. Um, I think that maybe they just didn't get funding. Well, they um, had 3.3 3 million to do, to do what they did in four years. And I think they just run out of money to continue to pursue that sort of a tech first VC backed property management space. And by the way, just for the listeners, let's, if you guys are not familiar with uh, ca- uh, Castle Property Management, they're the guys in Detroit who raised uh, VC money to go after this, uh, to sort of uh, digitize and make a technology-first property management uh, startup work. You know, if, if there's if there's one takeaway, um, I did a lot of the same stuff they did. Um, we, we spent a lot of money in technology, and, and if there's anything that I've learned, is that we, we think it's people first, tech second. Um, Absolutely. Tech- uh, great people will fix lousy processes and technology. Um, great technology will not fix lousy people. Um, now, that's not to say I think they had very good people, but it's just when you when you invest in the people front and you get great people to be able to handle challenges in this business, um, sometimes that's more effective than just a technology solution. Um, maybe, maybe that's my takeaway. So my read on that was very very similar, Mike. This is I'm actually I'm re- really really aligned with what you just said. My read on this was, was similar. You know, service, this is a service first industry and, 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 and they've done a great job putting an assembly together where as a business owner, it's good for you because you control the labor cost at each stage of the assembly line. But service does not, is not an assembly line. And what happened is they had all these the peop, account managers, then they had the people in the Philippines, then they had uh, stewards, they call them, and they had all these bunch of people who touched the customer. But the thing is, to you, it's great. To us, because we control labor, expense at every stage to the customer it's just a hodgepodge of different people pinging them for different reasons and they don't see the connection and the technology is supposed to bring that connection together but i guess it didn't um and to me it's just it's you're absolutely right it's it's like hey you you have to have somebody there with with some service background that that sort of made sure that the customer's relationship was handled through and through um Possibly, I, I don't know enough, but um, I hope Max will come to my podcast and talk about it at some point. Yeah, I mean, I mean, candidly, on my side, great group of guys. They did a right. lot of stuff right. I kind of just think that the they they needed just a little more funding, and I think it didn't totally pan out. And um, just given a different financing situation, I I think that they would have been successful with that, and probably are going to be really successful with whatever they take on. Yeah, I agree. But let's switch back to acquisitions um, and talk about growing by leaps right so so 3100 uh, let's go back to 3100 you go into 30,000 what do you give yourself two weeks you said but like realistically well that's because I was figuring this podcast would really help with some of these acquisitions here Alex so we're, we're working on that no I mean realistically you know it's a five-year plan we're, we're about a year in into that plan um and and uh so you kind of go I mean it's the question well how do you do that hopefully we find these awesome digital marketers that can drive tons of leads to us I'm looking around anywhere I can find somebody yep. there, Alex. Yep. So, so tough to find. Absolutely companies tough there, to like, find. In, Interly, we use four and a half to, to help generate um, a lot of leads for us, which we appreciate. Um, and, and that's that's a lot of it, right, is it's a lead game. So our organic growth has to be up there. Um, we love organic deals uh, just like anybody because we get to sign the homeowner up with the right expectation. You get the tenant with the right expectation. Um, we set them up for our company. They buy into it. And those are the deals that are the easiest. Um, and then the other part of the leaps and bounds piece, I guess, is that, you know, we've got to be able to find companies that are at different stages. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, they don't want to manage some of the properties that they've got. And we're hoping that we can help out with those. And and in order to do that, we got to be able to give people, you know, huge piles of cash. Um, so so that's that's part of our mission is to try to correctly value property management companies, um, because I think that they get grossly undervalued. And, uh, you know, whether we're looking at doing a deal through cash, through terms, 
through a partnership um, because we don't have to necessarily just buy out someone's company. We we've done you know we want to take people in, maybe give them a, a big salary and take over their portfolio and turn them into a part of our business development team. Whatever it is, I mean, we want to be able to give people the right amount for the company that they've spent a long time building. So with acquisitions, you know, I, I, there are like really three sort of major uh, problems people have with acquisitions. One of them is how to finance it. You talk about pile, piles of cash. The two is how to find the company that is for sale. I think that's the one you're struggling with and everybody else for, the, for that matter. And the three is once you acquire that company, how to integrate that in your current operations so you get, you know, the take advantage of economies of scale. So let's tackle one at a time. What would you, I mean, with your experience, Mike, how would you recommend people who want to buy other companies to finance that venture, that acquisition? Ideas? So if you, yeah, I mean, it's a lot like buying real estate, right? I mean, you got cash or you've got terms. Um, you know, cash can come in a couple of different forms. It's either through investor money, your own operations money, or, you know, some things we've actually been kind of exploring, which I haven't executed on, but we think is a strong possibility. Some things like SBA loans. Um, you know, I have a couple bankers that have been working on that. If you, if you have something that, you know, has the cash flow to support it, um, it seems like that could be an interesting alternative. Um, if you're really trying to put together a whole bunch of those deals. So that, that's the cash side, right? Um, outside investors, uh, bank loans, um, you know, your own capital from operations to be able to fund it. The second way to do it, I guess, is terms. Um, so, you know, you just kind of go, hey, you know, the, these doors are generating X amount per month. You take some percent of that and you're able to give it back to an owner. I think that if you're going with terms, somebody should expect to get, you know, two to three times more. I think that that's fair. You know, the difference between here's a big bag of money, but you don't ever have to talk to me ever again. And if you're trying to just be a broker, which some of our property managers are, you can go back and just do that full time. And hey, you get a big bag of money to go and continue to do that versus terms, which is really saying, well, you're going to get a monthly payment, um, you know, off of probably the you know percent of of the funds that are coming in from the property to do that. Uh, you really want to make sure that you're partnering, obviously, with good companies on both sides. You know, so the selling company wants to make sure that the buying company is going to execute and do everything they say they're going to, and the buying company really wants to make sure you know that the things that they're buying are are going to perform. Interesting. And so, when you do terms financing, um, how does the company that is for sale, how are they assured that they're going to get their payment? Yeah, uh, they're not. No. Uh, I mean, to some degree, right, there's some uncertainty whenever you're doing terms, which is why you should be getting paid two uh, to three times more. premium comes in. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you're going to be getting a little bit more money. Um, the only assurance you have is the credit and general honesty of the company that's buying you, in addition to a bunch of legal contracts and things that you sign. But, I mean, at the end of the day, if you feel like you were working with somebody who's just going to not pay you on what they're doing, you, you probably shouldn't do the deal. Um, whereas you, so, so a big part of these deals is trust. Um, and we kind of figured that out when we were first putting them together. I, I think, um, you know, we were pleasantly surprised about a year back. We kind of put out there, Hey, we'd buy some companies and people started calling us and we thought, yeah, they call us. And two days later we throw them back a number and, and it seemed like everything was good, but then the deal never closed because at some point there was a lack of trust. You know, people go, geez, I, I don't even know who you are. This is really a big transaction. We'd get, you know, a month into it and and it wasn't there so you know we started doing things where like we go and meet people face to face um, you know we travel out we, we check out their company uh, we encourage them to come to our office they don't have to but I mean if they come out and they meet our people they walk through our office it's weird funky colors and in a fun place but they get a vibe for what we're all about um, we try to understand where their heart is and I hope that they kind of understand where our heart is and like our heart is to you know make this industry better and to do good things and to really help their clients. And um, so you've got to be able to kind of build that that trust in order to put it together. So, so physical connection is, is helpful. Um, that, that's, I, have, I have not really heard anybody verbalize that before. So phys, you know, it's a big transaction. So, you know, fly and, and shake hands and have a lunch, right? That's kind of it because I, I think that we all get so caught up in putting deals together. I mean, I, I just sit all day and put together real estate deals, right? That's what I do. So it's, it's very easy to just have one more deal fly across your desk and you're like, nah, here's the number and here's the thing and, you know, let's figure it out. You know, let's go, go negotiate it. 
But I mean, these, these are people's businesses. I mean, this is something that, this is someone's life. Um, you know, Bill and I, Bill's in charge of uh, acquisitions on this side. And, and we found that figuring out what someone's going to do after they sell their company is actually really important. Um, because that has actually been a stopper on some of our deals. Is, you know, they actually say, oh, I hate this company. It's driving me crazy. And we get to some point and they'll call and say, but what am I going to do? And we go, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, do nothing. Like, isn't that what you wanted? No, actually it wasn't. You know, I, I found a lot of value in helping people and helping to manage homes. And, and I started thinking about this. I don't know what I'm going to do, so I'm not going to sell the company anymore. Um, and and, and that's, a, that's a valid thing. I mean, personally, I don't know what I would do. Um, so kind of mapping out that plan for somebody, you know, you're going to be a broker. You can make three times more with the commissions that you're seeing from your current business than you're doing now. That makes sense. Um, you're somebody that needs to go relax. You're going to go sit on an island. Let me help you get the ticket. Um, <laughs> you know, here, here, it's going to be nice, man. And, and maybe you need to decompress. So kind of setting those things up, I think, is really important. Interesting, Mike. I wanted to take a pause uh, from this interview for just a uh, a few minutes and talk about our sponsor. Our sponsor today is Four and Half, my own company, and our brand new product, One Partner website platform. You see, the problem with websites is that once you have it built, there's really no changes being made until you're ready for a new one in three to four or five years down the line. So the website's not keeping up with your business, and if you are making changes on your website, you are left guessing on how those changes will improve the performance of the website, right? So one partner solves that. We solve it in three ways. The website platform that we have focuses on leads, data, and data-driven decisions. Let me explain. First and foremost, the website is designed with your perfect customer experience in mind first. It's all about them, professional copy, larger text, easy, clean layout, super fast loading, videos, explainer videos throughout the website, lead magnets like ebook download and rental analysis uh, imp implemented throughout the website where they make sense. We also help you with a three-tier pricing plan. We have a, a framework that will help you and will consult you on putting together the pricing plan to baffle your competition and play in different uh, uh, price spectrums for your customers and create an upsell opportunity within your company. Definitely going to lead your local market if you are able to introduce that. And so all of that uh, means little if we don't have the if the website does not rank. Well, four and a half uses the last six years of our experience to implement SEO uh, best practices throughout the website, inside the website, outside the website, um, connect all your digital channels all your social media channels and have that sort of a presentation of who you are as a brand, consistent, clean, and very, very easy for your customers to understand. Now, the second element here is the business performance dashboard. It's the data. There's so much of it out there. Who cares, right? I can't dig into Google Analytics and try to understand what does, uh, you know, what is my bounce rate and how does that, how is that relevant to my website SEO? Well, so what we've done is we distilled all that information coming from, you know, 10 other sources, you know, including your CRM, your reputation channels, your Google Analytics, uh, and so on, into a simple dashboard that answers three questions. Where are my leads are coming from? How much does it cost me per lead from all these different lead sources? And it has a trigger built in on where and when to double down. You see, our team uses this information to study the performance of your, of your website every 90 days, and we get on the phone with you and we'll figure out what to build next, whether it's new landing pages, whether it's proving different, putting different videos in different places, whether it's uh, um, essentially explain, do a better job explaining the particular services you have, whatever we find from the data and, and the opportunities to make the performance improvements, we pass them on to you on a continuous basis and would build those out. That is what One Partner Platform is all about. If you want to learn more, if you want to stand out from a competition, if you really want to move your business to the next level, do yourself a favor. Go to fourandhalf.com forward slash one partner and see what we have. Let's get back to the show. Interesting, Mike. So, so summarize uh, cash, loan, terms, a combination of, of each. 
Um, no. More importantly, meet somebody face to face. You know, do take the time to learn who the acquirer or the uh, person being acquired, company being acquired, and also um, really be honest with them and with yourself. What the what post exit strategy? Like, what are you doing? Right? What are you gonna do as a business owner? You know, <laughs> I've seen a lot of people who sold their companies only to regret it. Like that's, that conversation never happened. They saw the check, it went for it, and they're not happy. Yeah, you got you got to kind of like think through the whole entire thing, right? Um, you know, I mean, if if the company is paying for all of your cars, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you might want to think about that a little bit. You know, if if you're gonna go hang out and sit on an island, um, you know, how long is that gonna be? What's that gonna look like? And and so. The truth is, is a lot of people that are selling companies in the property management space are, are probably trying to do a couple of things. One is they just see a little more money right now on the brokerage side. And they also see um, this industry is, you know, there are no not so many of those accidental landlords. Right. So, I mean, that, they dried that's up. Becoming- they dried up for now. They for now. There you go. Um, so a lot of people whose whole property management business was built off of accidental landlords. I mean. It's a shrinking portfolio. You might want to just capitalize on it where it's at and go in and work on something else while there's still value there. Because, um, for example, we had a company that came to us a year and a half ago, had about 350 homes, came back to us a few months ago, had 200. I, you know, I mean, like the trajectory on this thing is just okay. going in the wrong. I mean, so that just killed their value. So, I mean, if you've had a pretty good run and you can still show that there's a little growth, but you as an owner kind of know eh, a lot of accidental owners in here. I mean, now might be the right time to tap out and let it happen while acquirers can get good interest rates, you know, feel pretty bullish on the market and are still goofy like us and, uh, you know, want to continue to grow in this yeah. industry. So let me, let me run something by you. I, I think you might be able to, to help me sort of validate my macro uh, point of view on this, on the state of the industry right now. Um, I, I feel this is sort of a, a – and, and feel free to poke at it, like – for sure. Uh, we're in a state of suspension. <laughs> not, not literally, man. No. <laughs> oh, all right. That's actually but, uh, poking. Uh, right. Yeah, you know, there's a good number of people watching us on video. Um, they just saw that. Uh, mm. <laughs> you poked Should have told me that before we did this, Alex. That uh, would have been good to know. But so, 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 so think about this. Um, so property managers do really well at, at the down market. You know, we saw that in 11, 12, 13, 14, right? Really well. They do really well in a pretty well in a hot market, 15, 16, pretty well. Because, you know, in one, there's accidental landlords, and the other, there's just a lot of exits. So you, you, you cash out, you cash them out, and you make commissions. We're in a sort of, sort of little bit of a suspension state. This is in between cycles, you know, cyclical for recession uh, um, cycles. Um, we're sort of like right there where we're between the down and past the up. And so for the next couple of years, it's going to be fairly quiet in terms of accident and landlord, as you pointed out. And we see as a marketing company, we see that completely. Those who do not focus their marketing message on investors, that, that accident landlord went like drastic. They got reduced by like 70%. And what do you feel about this economic sort of a state? Um, and, 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 and the next, I guess the next question is, the way I see it is we're going to go slowly down, slowly down for the next four or five years, eventually hitting that low again before we go back up. How do you feel about that prediction? Well, I mean, I, I think you, you're really kind of hitting it, Alex. I mean, um, there's needs and wants, right? So when somebody needs to move because their job just relocated them and they're $50,000 upside down on their home and they don't have the money they need a property manager, right? Or they need to rent their home out and then you can decide how they're going to do it, but they're probably going to hire a property manager. So you have a huge market that's in need. And when you have a business that fills a need, it's a strong business. Then there's a want. A want is an investor that says, you know, I'd love to earn 10% on my money. They don't need to earn 10% on their money. They could choose to go into the stock market. They could do different things they want to earn 10% on their money and you're trying to sell them that. And the cost for leads on a want are much higher than the cost for leads on a need. That's just how it is. Um, so as you look across the country and depending on your own geographic location of your portfolio, you're going to have a drastically different experience. Um, so if you are in a place like Atlanta where investors 
see it as a darn good place to invest money, you're going to have certain outcomes with investors that you're not going to have in New Jersey. Um, you know, and that's no offense to, you know, we need property managers in New Jersey. We actually manage some homes in New Jersey, but there's just not as many investors that, you know, if I call them and say, man, I got to, I got to. Well, San Francisco is the same New thing. People are priced out and investors are priced out. I mean, the techies yeah. are just going nuts here. It's just, there's no. The, way so, I mean, the returns are horrible. So what we're kind of doing is, is uh, we're parlaying money from California and we're helping them buy money down South or we're taking right. money from New York and we're helping them, you know, buy stuff in Texas, you know, so kind of depending on where your company is located could really impact the next three to five years where you talk about there being a little bit of a limbo there um, because it, it's being able to work with investors and be in markets that they want to be. And so kind of on the whole acquisition and selling your company thing, I, I mean, that's something that I think people have to look at is kind of going like, all right, you know, what is this portfolio made up of? Is it made up of investors that are acquiring things or is it made up of accidental landlords? And the other flip on this is really the investors, I mean, are seeing huge growth. So sometimes you talk to somebody, they bought a home three years ago, you know, a hundred thousand dollar home and we're calling them back and going, Hey, it's worth 180. Yeah. I mean, like there's, there's a certain profit taking thing that's just going to happen. And I mean, you know, you, you can't really blame them. Now you hope that they're going to parlay those gains into a couple other properties and we can reposition them with something, but um, you know, you, you just don't know. So I think your pulse is right on. Um, we've moved out of, um, the accidental landlord, we've moved into the um, investor kind of mode. Uh, there's there's sort of, let's call them amateur investors that, that kind of have one to four homes. Not necessarily that they don't know what they're doing. It's just, you know, that's where they're at. Sure. Um, we seem to cater really to that very well. And we do very well with people that maybe get, you know, four to, to 20 properties. And then there's also kind of a cutoff once, you know, people exceed maybe 100 properties where they're just probably going to internalize that management. And as a third party property manager, it's more difficult to keep those people around or you change your whole business. As we've done for a couple of clients, you know, they work with you for 12 months and then they go and internalize it, uh, which which ends up hurting you just a little big bit. time. So, yeah, that's a big, exit. That's a big revenue. So, exit. I mean, we're a counter cyclical business in what could be the biggest bull run of 100 years. So, you know, I mean, being able to step back as an owner and understand where we're at. So, I mean, if you're deciding between being a broker and a property manager, you either need to be the best property manager on earth or you should go and be a broker. And that's just how we view it. And so our focus, goal, right? we yeah, our goal is to be the best. Right. So, I mean, um, you know, in our particular niche and in our particular vertical of managing homes for investors and accidental landlords, we just want to be great at it. And we feel like even in a market where there's there's a lot of competition, if you're great, you can survive. If you're somebody that's a mom and pop and you're sitting out there and you manage 70 homes and you kind of do it out of your basement, you may need to reflect back and go, am I the best? Um, am I the best person in this area to manage people's homes? Are my reviews better than everyone else's? Uh, all my tenants suck. Yeah, but like, honestly, you know, sometimes that online reputation stuff does matter a little bit. And, you know, if you look at it and you kind of go, I'm not the absolute most dominant person in this market. It, it might not be a mistake to to sell it off while there's still some value there, um, while you've got some things that are going up, and you know, look at some alternatives. I don't know. That's that's our thought process. That's well Same put. I mean, that is well put. I think people uh, listening right now, I mean, some s s s some will find themselves in a similar situation, and this is th thought provoking, very thought provoking because counter cyclical. I really like that we are counter cyclical and we do really well. And I say we, I, I belong to this. It's my tribe, man. I, I spent the last nine years here. <laughs> First selling out all your property where then starting my own company and getting here. Now we're 27 employees, you know, growing pretty fast. Very, very happy to be here. That's a good crew there, Alex. Right, conference. Yeah, man, man. So proud. So proud. Thanks yeah, for uh, pumping first, up man. the economy a little bit with in. some jobs, man. We appreciate that. That's Service, good. baby. That's it. Thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> um, but, um, um, but, but the truth of it is that, yeah, it, when you're in the middle of that cycle, it's sort of suspension, right? It's it, even if we if we reverse the cycle, it's still the middle, which is kind of nowhere. Um, so yeah, I think we're aligned on that. That's great, Mike. So let's go to the next one. I mean, you and I go on tangents like twenty minutes long. <laughs> Love it. <so. laughs> it makes it more interesting, it man. Does. People don't want people don't want canned podcasts. Those aren't fun. Hi right, guys, if you don't like this, uh, email me Alex at four and a half dot com. Say hey. Mike went on way big of a tangent. Or you, Alex, should be more pointed. If you're talking acquisition, stick to it. Just email yeah, me. Like, like who is this guy that just keeps rambling over here? Where'd they find this? <laughs> no, it was great. Man. I think it was. Uh, I'm gonna re-listen to it and and 
and dig wisdom because right now I'm listening I'm trying to sort of write notes and stuff I, I want to go back to this stuff and really sort of internalize it's good it's good stuff um, so next question so I think we talk I think we've done a decent job decent job where we can at this point to, to sort of okay hit us hard finance it but now let's talk about finding finding acquisitions what do you do what do you do to find those smaller uh, 70 to 100 unit portfolio people who are kind of burnt out ready to exit what do you do to find a larger one yeah so uh Phone is a powerful tool okay, there, so Alex. So, for those who are not watching so, the video, Mike just picked up the phone. He's uh, all right. Yeah, phones. it was just quite a quite a, a visual thing there. No, I mean, um, you know, we have got uh, you know a, a team. Um, uh, Bill Collins on our team is is in charge of acquisitions, and that's part of his job is to reach out and stay in touch, um, and, and just talk with people and kind of see what's going on. And um, you know, there, there's a lot of people that we've been talking to for years. Um, and just kind of staying in touch, seeing where they're at. You know, sometimes you call somebody and maybe they're um, 63 years old and they're going, you know, I like maybe the market's kind of right to do this, but I'm not quite there yet. You know, I, I'm close. I'd like to retire in a few years maybe, but I'm not quite there yet. And so we just try to keep, you know, hanging out, um, kind of like staying around, letting them know that we're here, um, you know, kind of seeing how they're doing and where their pulse is at so that when you get somebody who really does reach the point of going like, man, it's, it's probably time for, for us to go in a different direction. You know, we're, we're somebody that they think about. So you, you, know, you have, you, know, you have people who you've been in talks for a while. It's a longer sales cycle. It's a longer transition cycle, but you keep, keep them sort of thinking and talking to you. I think that's a little part of it. And then, you know, you're trying to reach out and, and uh, yeah, you just got to kind of stay involved in the industry stuff. Like, you know, attending your awesome, uh, event that you're putting PM Growth Summit, right. yeah. Like That's you're going the, to do you know, so, in a few days here? Uh, I mean, I'm in. I, I, I think everybody should be there, uh, Alex. So, oh, so you. yeah, I mean, honestly, just networking, connecting with people, and um, and, and then letting people, um, you know, be very private um, and come and chat with you and be open and just talk to them honestly. You know, you know, you uh, <laughs> you, you manage a bunch of homes in a very weird place, you know, this might not be the right fit for us or, you know, wow, you're in a great place. You know, you can probably get a very strong multiple on what you're doing. Um, that's a place we'd love to be. You know, you're, you're going to get a lot of money on that. Um, you know, and we try to just kind of, we lay things out on the table and just go, you know, that's, that's what we're going to be able to give you. And, um, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but, um, but there's you know. no way you guys don't use any technology or any specific outreach. Does Bill have any kind of a, maybe like an email, uh, 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 funnel uh, or something, some content to, to go after, you know, and, and at least let people know that you are acquiring. I mean, any other tools that we can share with the audience? Any other <laughs> secrets? Maybe there's a secret you want to share. You want our secrets, Alex? I have no one. idea that that's what this was about. Um, well, you know, I'd say a podcast with Alex could be ah. maybe the best way to, to go about uh, putting this together. No, I mean, we have lists. I mean, you can get lists of property managers and you can go in and reach out. I mean, you know, you know, NARP them. I mean, like they'll, they'll give you a list. I mean, you can you can get all the owners and stuff and kind of send out some emails and, and target people. Cool. All right. Um. Well, that's that's a hard subject. That's a that's a really hard one. I haven't heard. Um, there's not really so. Besides, I think everybody's answer at this point is networking, just networking and and, and constant reach out. I mean, you were ahead of the game because you have somebody actually doing in charge of this. That's... Well, and, and you know the biggest thing here is just I, I think why this is maybe interesting for anyone that's listening to this podcast. It, you go, well, I don't want to sell a company. I don't even want to buy a company. I'm just trying to grow my own company and do it organically. Is there always has to be an end in mind? Right. So, I mean, for me, we want to take it public in five years and then I want to stay here another 20. I mean, I, I just I'm I'm too young and I got nothing to do. Right. So that that's that's a, and I like pain, you know. So, so, I mean, we like inflicting pain on ourselves and staying in this crazy industry. So, you know, that, that's kind of my plan. But, but you have to have something set up so that whether you're going, you know, I'm, I'm 30 years old and in 20 years or in 30 years, I might be done or I'm 60 years old and in five or 10 years in, in building a business with that end in mind is a great idea. Right. So so kind of going like, how do we build structure? How do we build process? Who are the people who would be in charge of running this if I get hit by a bus? Um, you know, how is this thing going to keep going? How do you build an institution instead of something that's like Mike Kalis Realty? You know, this is not about me. Our company's not. We got a lot of great people and they're better than me. And it's humbling and embarrassing. But they're 
a lot smarter than I am. So, um, you know, and, and you have to be able to kind of like do that um, so that you can build a company that actually has more value than just a, a real um, small multiple on your homes. And, and we see a big difference between, um, you know, people who weren't quite able to get through that threshold um, and um, are basically just saying like, here, I'm, I'm done, take it, um, versus people who can step back. Um, like we have a company right now that's asking for $2 million for their company, and I think it's reasonable. Um, I hope they're not watching. Yeah. One yeah, man, that's great um, negotiation yeah, tactic. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, like, like genuinely, because they've created something that, that actually um, is a thing and, and is an institution and is producing, you know, financial results, right? Versus somebody who just kind of has 50 doors that, you know, they're, you know, doing their best to handle all the phone calls, but kind of going out of their mind. Which takes us to the next point. Actually, it takes us really nice. It's like a super nice transition. Into, You're welcome. You pay premium for an established institution, brand, what have you. Um, how do you integrate that into marketplace homes? This is where I want to spend some time. I mean, you obviously have a specific processes, specific systems, specific beliefs, specific pricing. Take me through the integration process. You bought it. Great. What's next? Yeah. So um, everything goes crazy and uh, we lose all the owners immediately. No, that, that would be <laughs> one possible answer. outcome. All right. So, so, so genuinely on the table, that could happen. Uh, so what we do is we try to put everything in place so that that doesn't happen. Um, so we have an onboarding team. Um, we assign specific people from each department to that portfolio. So it's not, you know, our whole team of 85 people, but it's usually a team of three or four people that are going to be in charge of transitioning all of those um, contracts over. We contact um, someone from our, our, we call it our solutions team, uh, goes through and calls every single homeowner um, to talk to them about a partnership. Um, we want to try to structure it more as, you know, this is a partnership. We're working with so-and-so. Um, you call every single client to be acquired? The contracts are not just automatically assignable? Oh, we call every owner. Every owner. So, every so owner. they might be assignable, but I mean, a, an owner can still just not like me. I mean, it sounds shocking because I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind, I'm humorous, you know, I'm fun to be around. But like sometimes they don't like me, which is hard for me. Um, but, um, you know, they can choose and say, you know, I don't like marketplace homes for whatever reason. So we get out in front of that by calling everybody and telling them, you know, hey, this is really great. You were working with so-and-so. Now we're going to be handling some of the rent collection service charges and everything else. We're in a bit of a partnership here where we're working together, but here's where your calls are going to be routed. Here's how all this is going to work. We keep the exact same fee structure of whatever that they was had my before. Next question. Interesting. Um, so we think that's really important. I guess people could argue with it, but um, you know, we I don't I don't want to call a homeowner and say, "Hey, great news! I'm going to be helping you out, and I'm going to be doubling your fee." Uh, so anyway, I hope that's not a problem. You know, so I mean, we want to be able to kind of reach out to them and say, uh, you know, it's going to be the exact same fee structure. We're going to keep most of the processes the same. There's a few things we do internally, like, you know, 8776-GET-FIX is our service hotline, right? Or you can go online and fill it out. That's probably different than the number they were calling or the website they were going to prior. So it's just some of those, like, little operational things that you're going to kind of take people through, um, you know, that they need to know. And then our hope for the owners um, is a little bit of just making sure they stay, but also looking for other opportunities. You know, do, do they have other homes? Um, do they want to sell their properties? You know, can we help them with that? You know, what, what are, what are their goals? What are they hoping to do? So onboarding the owners, um, getting the process with the tenants. We have a back end team that would contact every tenant and do the same thing. Just a quick 30 minute, you know, here's what we do. Here's how it works. Um, if you can't get a hold of somebody, you can't get a hold of somebody, but we try to call them three times and, you know, get out in front of it a little bit. Um, and then working with, with the owners of the current business. And it kind of depends on how badly they want out, right? Is, I mean, you can you could structure a deal where you could really cut ties and just kind of be done. Um, and, and we can set that up. And if someone's at that stage, we get it. Um, but more often, it, it's kind of a, a few month process to, to move everything from one side to the other. Um, yeah, just a side note, if anyone wants to like feel good about themselves, everyone's books stink. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's one lesson I've learned is if you're if you're running a business and you have good books, um, I'm immediately suspicious and there's something really wrong. Dude, you should look uh, at my books. My my stuff is clean, man. I have an accountant and a CPA. Oh wow, then I'm I'm suspicious. I don't know this much, but I got but basically, to hide, I guarantee you. Yeah. Every property manager we we've talked to, um, you know, you say, hey, great, you know, put together a P and L, and they all go, you know, I'll be able to have well, that ready. They're running for you their personal stuff uh, through their company. That's that's where it gets money. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. That Vacation, or trip, blah, blah, there aren't blah, any books. Cars, um, so, you know, and, and, and here's the, the truth of it is, is because we're in this industry, sometimes it's okay. I mean, I mean, we can really just look at it and go, look, here's how many homes you got. Here's the contracts you've got. We're going to figure this out. So if you feel like your books are a big jumbled mess, which might be part of the reason why you don't even want to be in this business anymore, like it's okay. I mean, we can step and just look at how many contracts you have and be able to kind of give you a, a reasonable multiple. Because the truth is, I don't care what someone's profit and loss statement is per se. I care what the value is once it gets into our organization. Um, so, I mean, we're running it off of that. Hmm. So um, now as a marketer, I am extremely curious, what do you do? with the brand do you what is your you sunset what is your sort of horizon how do you how do you think about the company name website and all the brand association um i don't know i call people like you alex and try to get like better ideas um you know <laughs> what's been successful what's been working for you um from a branding standpoint right Wait, can I tell you what doesn't work? <laughs> um, you know, what, what hasn't worked very well, um, and if I could go back and change, I would, was running our brokerage and our property management company under the same name. Um, and, and we've just, there were licensing issues and other things as we expanded into a whole bunch of states and we did that. But if I could go back in time, if there's somebody new on here that's like starting their company and you have a brokerage and you have a property management company, just name of something different. Um, and, and that's because you get reviews on the property management side that are tougher, right? And then on the brokerage side, it's over. Um, it confuses people, you know, wait, you know, internally, it makes a ton of sense operationally for, you know, you manage a home and somebody says, I want to sell it. Great. We can sell it. You know, that makes perfectly good sense. But even from Google and SEO and other reasons online, Split them. I, I'm with yeah. you 100. percent Yeah, so I, I so I, maybe, I messed it up for Google. Maybe I didn't ask my question right. What do you do with the acquired brand? Oh, um, <laughs> well, up until very recently, um, our our goal was to really just throw it under our umbrella, and uh, we wanted to do that. The exception, and some of the folks we've been talking to would be if there's something that we feel, um, you know, carries carries some equity. Um, then we would consider running it and keeping it under our umbrella if it made sense. And, and we've got a couple things right now that we're working on that that we might do that. Hmm. So you keeping you you changing it to marketplace homes website, marketplace homes, marketing, branding, all that. Yeah. So so most homes would go into that with the exception of stuff we're like working on today. Um, so um, we, we've always done that in the past because that made the most sense, right? That's the economic thing. I got all this fixed overhead. I mean, this business is really simple. You have a bunch of fixed overhead and people and the more doors that you can add, the better, right? And so we've sort of set up and you scale to different degrees. For us, there was a, a problem we went into at 30 doors. It was just me. Then at about 300 when we had about 25 people. And then at about 1,000 when all of a sudden I needed middle management. Right. So for us, those were just three different walls. And once you bust through each of those walls, there's some profit on the other side until you hit the next wall or steps. If you want to look at it, because everyone thinks a business goes like I this. Love that, man. Yeah, good. Okay. Steps, right? so, whoop, whoop. And so we kind of feel like we're at a step right now where we've really scaled and, and built the overhead for about 10,000 doors and we're at 3000. So the marginal increase for us of every door that we're bringing in at this moment is quite big. Um, so our original goal was you just throw them all under marketplace homes. We run them through our whole entire team. You know, that's how it's going to work. Um, but recently we've had a couple companies that, you know, frankly are great companies, um, have good brands, um, have decent backend processes and some things where we kind of go like, Hmm, that's actually a pretty clever idea. Um, you know, and, and if that's the case, then, you know, we could kind of keep that under the umbrella of our companies, but maybe run it, you know, for its own company within its own niche and what it's doing. And, and keep it that way. I mean, I guess the bottom line is we're always open, man. We're a bunch of deal guys. I mean, this, this is real estate. So, you know, I, I mean, people bring us stuff and kind of go, how, how do we put this deal together? We just try to be really open. You try to solve people's problems, um, you know, and make it work. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, what is your customer acquisition cost? Okay. So different for every funnel and every market. You know what the biggest change in that is? And, and I can speak to this and you probably could too be doing it nationally is, is the city that you operate in. Oh, yeah. um, so, okay. so we've noticed, you know, tremendous changes in acquisition, but I mean, if you just want numbers, um, you know, anywhere from four to $700 for okay. a door. So that, that's fair. And that's across, you know, that's across in some areas actually is even more, but 
Um, but that so like we get down to Texas and it seems crazy high to me. Um, and then you get to, you know, other places and it, it seems a lot lower places that I don't want to mention. Cause I like them. Yes. Albuquerque, New Mexico, you know, I know. Oh, cool. we love Albuquerque. That's all I'm going to mention. No, but, but you're right. There's some underrated cities. That is like cities. one of the worst markets in the U S which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, Google, real, real Google rancho, not, man. you see a lot of trends there, um, on Google and, and, and the search patterns. That's where it's at. Yeah, we, we, I mean, genuinely, Rio Rancho, New Mexico, man, um, that, that's a, a good market that um, does require a lot of, uh, a lot of property management. Yeah, and it's like 200 bucks to buy a client there or less, right, on average. Yeah. Yeah, so that's good. But, you know, yeah, you know, you know that, that, that's good. So I think, Mike, I think we covered a lot of things. Um, I, I, I want to say that, number one, I really appreciate your time. I know it's hard to get you to do these things. Um, but I'm really glad we did. I, had, I, I enjoyed this conversation. And guys, if you're looking to advice on buying or selling a property management company, look, give Mike Callis a call um, or an email. Mike, how would they reach you? Or Bill, give me your, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, I mean, go to marketplacehomes.com. There's a little tab on there that says talk to Mike. I, I look at all of those. Or it's just mike.callis um, at marketplacehomes.com. And those come through and, and we'd set up a meeting. Or uh, give us a ring, uh, 734-862-4750. You um, yeah, you want me to like how about you give me a Snapchat, your Twitter handle, uh, what else the kids are yeah. into these days? Yeah, <laughs> honestly, like the, the email stuff works uh, yeah. probably the best. And, and I check that um, all the time, and we, we'd schedule a, a time to chat. Um, out, outside of just acquisition stuff, if people are just curious about talking about business, I, I love it. So if there's deals or things people want to chat about, I'm always available. Um, and then, um, you know, how, how do I get like tons and tons of leads online? And like, do you know anybody that does that? Or they're like, yeah, yes, I can yeah, that. Does that. And, uh, you guys probably schedule a conversation. But for this show, I think, I think we'll call it a wrap. Guys, thank you very much for listening.